Good afternoon, everyone. This is Larry Williams. It is the uh, 17th day of October 2013, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to this presentation. It's going to be an interesting one for a couple of reasons. Um, to begin with, if, uh, the, we have a lot of people on today. If you have a problem, you drop out. We will be repeating this in an hour and a half from now. Um, so I don't think we'll be having any dropout problems, but in the event you do, you'll know what's going on. Also, I will do my best uh, to answer any questions that you have. This is going to be very educational today. You're going to see a lot of things I've not talked about before, so you may buy, want to take notes on this as well. We will not be sending out PowerPoints to anybody on this at all, okay? Uh, if you do have questions, type them in. I will do my best to answer the ones that I think are the most pertinent. And with that, let's begin. What I really want to go over is what I call breaking news. Something's happened uh, in the last couple of days. We talked about this on my uh, Larry TV earlier this week. Uh, I want to show you the um, new index that represents the old CRB index. In Trade Station, this is dollar sign CCI. This is a new continuous commodity contract. It's a product of uh, Reuter Thompson. They put this together to replace the old CRB. So I have the CRB index up here. We'll call it CRB index. At least I'm so accustomed to that. Down below, the price of gold. Notice what happens when we broke out of big trend lines in the old CRB index. We rally in the price of gold. At least we did there. We're coming forward now. That was uh, 2009 and 10. We're coming in 2012. Look at this big long-term trend line in the CRB index, and look what happens to gold shortly thereafter. Not only on this very short-term trend line, but also the longer-term trend line, which penetrated here. Well, gold was still in the doldrums. Then we had a penetration to the downside of the CRB index, and uh, gold went down, as you well know. Now here's where we are today. We've broken firmly above the CRB index, this long-term downtrend that I've been talking about. Uh, it happened today primarily because of the move in gold and soybeans and a couple of other markets. So I think this is a significant breaking news development. This is something I just put together today for this presentation because we have seen a real significant trend change here in the CRB index. And I think that has implications that we are starting a bull market in commodity prices. That also typically includes stock prices. Um, I can't get my screen any fuller than that, Mark. I'm sorry. So uh, that's um, a, an important thing to look at. That's not what this webinar was originally about, but I think it's something you better be considering over the next um, trading few trading sessions. We've had a real trend change here in the uh, CRB index. So with that, let's go take a look at the stock market, bonds, and gold I'll be discussing as well as today. I want to talk about forecasting, how forecasting can be done. Well, when you forecast, you have a time scale down here and a price scale here. That's all we have is price and time. We don't have anything else to forecast with just those two elements. But what does that really mean? Well, time scale is fixed. It doesn't change. 30 weeks from to now is going to be 30 weeks from to now. That's a fixed scale here and here and here and here. Now, whether it's my forecasting work or anybody else's, this is going to be an important lesson for you. The time scale doesn't change. Time is fixed. We must go 50 weeks into the future. We may or may not go $50 into the up or down. So while the time frame is a fixed frame and we must hit time points for sure, the magnitude of the move, that's the price scale, is not nearly as clear to us nor I think as easily to predict. We can get a sense of the pattern of price and that's more important. I mean after all when you're trading you're looking for a time to be a buyer, a time to be a seller. But the magnitude of the move uh, sometimes is predictable, sometimes it isn't and that's why we're traders. If the world was that easy as I'll show you in a moment how cycles can pretend to be easy. Uh, it would be quite simple to be a trader. We are trying to expand the screen size for you now. So if you're seeing a double image here, just bear with us. I, some people are saying that the screen isn't large enough. So we're, um, we're, they do like the cats, though. Those are Louise's cats. <laughs> That's Gershwin you're looking at. Gershwin, the famous commodity trader. He, uh, he's long catnip futures. Uh, bear with us a moment here. Hey, Dr. Trotter, how are you doing? Anyway, good to see you here. I'm going to just pause that for a moment. 
Okay, this is going to take about one minute while Louise uh, shoes the kitties away. Okay, we're back. Uh, sorry about that delay. We're not disconnected and we haven't stopped. We are resizing the screen. Uh, yes, this is coming from the Virgin Islands. Uh, that's where we are. It's a perpetual summer down here. Uh, winter is not beginning as it is for some of you. So back to the point here. Time is fixed. We must have a low X number of days from today uh, in terms of a cycle. But the, the price scale going up and down this way, we may or may not go to 50 or 40 or 60 or 2000. That's what makes this art of forecasting somewhat difficult and something we do need to deal with. We're tempting fate and we're really trying the impossible when we're getting in this business of forecasting. So our expectation should be for close calls, not exact matches. I'm continually surprised, actually astonished at sometimes where people say, well, your forecast didn't get the absolute high of the market. Well, I don't really expect it to do that. I think this is very much a business of trying to get close and get the sense of when significant moves will start in the market. Um, but sometimes we actually do get the highs and lows, but mm, not all the time. And I think this is A, B, I'm still learning how to do this. I'm gonna show you some of those things I've learned today. A and it goes with the territory. Uh, I mean, we really are trying to do the impossible and tempting fate, but it can be done at times. Here's a good example. This was a chart we showed at the first of this year, the three year pattern for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. This is simply all years average in three. So this would be 1913, uh, 1903, 1923, 1933, all average together. On average has been a good buy point in March, a good buy point in August, and a good sell point in uh, June, and a good sell point in September. On average, that's been the way. Now. This gets back to what we were talking about. This is the fixed frame. This represents buying and selling opportunities. The magnitude, this is the one that we really are uncertain of. We're more certain about there should be a rally starting in March, a rally starting in August, a sell-off starting in the middle of September, and a sell-off somewhere around the 1st of June. That's what we would expect based on that pattern. So really in the land of blind, the one-eyed man is king. If we can take a pattern like this, and then start to project that into the future, then we have some advantages on the marketplace. And that's really what we're looking for here. Another thing we can look at is the, the magnitude, as I talk about. Here's the real strong cycle in the bond markets. has been a 13-week cycle. This has been a dominant cycle for a long time. Sometimes it has a great up move in the market, sometimes not much effect at all. This last move was a nice up move in the market. This one wasn't. The down move was successful here. That's a 13-week down move. Here's a 13-week down move, another 13-week down move. So you really have to adjust the cycle forecast with what's going on with the market, with the expectation there should be highs coming at this time and buying opportunities coming at these times. So uh, keep that in mind when we're looking with the cyclical action in, uh, in these forecasts. Here's a little bit more of 2013 in review. Um, this was the seasonal pattern of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. This is my true seasonal pattern. It is not quite what you will see in any other software because of the way we compute it. Um, but this is what's really happened in the market up to two days ago at least. The uh, purple line that you see here is a cumulative sum of advancing and declining stocks. It made us high for the year uh, about this time when we'd expect a seasonal high to come into the marketplace. And that March buy point that we saw from the 2013, the, the combination of three years, well, that was right here. That was a big rally we saw up until about June 1st when we came down. So we're getting a sense of when these markets should have their moves. Uh, the September time period was a sell-off we've seen recently. Notice this line, though, did not make a new high here while well, stocks have been making a new high. I think that the more important index is to watch this cumulative sum of advancing and declining stocks because when it diverges we usually see significant moves in the opposite direction. I'll get back to that in a little bit but let's talk about what's coming up right here right now. Um, this is something we did at Larry TV so some of you are familiar with this. This is a report we do at the first of every month. This is the S&P the E-minis and this is each trading day of the month for October. So we see trading day 15 has made $6,500 and in the last uh, 15 years, 14 of those years were successful. Well, that is October 21st. We're not quite there yet, but we're not that far away from it. So we see we have a buying point coming in the market 
on October 10th, we had 15 years. 13 of those trades were successful. Go back and look at October 10th. What happened in E-minis this year in October 10th was the start of a significant rally. So we now see, and the weakness we saw at the first of the month, well, there it is. That's typically what's happened in Octobers. We see now coming into trading day 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, a lot of residual strength in the S&Ps over the years at this end of the month in October, which would suggest to us, at least as a short term or day trader, I want to work the long side of this market at this time period. Would somebody do me a favor and just type in a question? I'm not certain that I'm seeing any questions if they come in or not here. Um, so if somebody would do that, that would be great. Question test, got it, thanks, okay, we're, we're working, thank you. Okay, so uh, we see that we have some seasonal biases coming in for bullishness at the end of October. Uh, today is trading day, I think we're back in here, These, the big day here and here is where we are. So those can be very helpful to you as short-term traders. Um, I don't know what type of cat that was, John, I'll have to ask Louise. She stepped out of the room right now. It's just an old barn cat, I think. A barn cat, she said. Okay, so that gives us a sense of what's coming up for October. You might want to pay some attention to that. And if you're not on Larry TV, you can see this every weekend or at the first of every month on Larry TV. Where do you get 10, 10, 12 from? These dates I just uh, looked and counted. Trading day 8 this year in October is October 10th. Trading day 15 is October 21st. Trading day 19, I thought you guys and gals would like to know about that. It's going to occur on October 25th. Now, does that mean I'm going to be buying on the 19th? No, I might start to buy here or here because I definitely want to be looking at the market at that time period, don't I, to see how the market's responding to this. I might buy on late on the 17th. So you need to pay some attention to the market too. Uh, <laughs> our CAT scan, yeah. I don't have any signal service. No, I used to a long time ago. We had commodity timing, but... You know, guys and gals at 71 years of age, I just don't have the patience to do a daily service. It's such a grind to do. And I have my own trading to take care of, my own research to take care of. So fortunately, uh, my success with trading has allowed us to spend a little bit more time away from doing every night reports. Uh, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a real pain to do them. It's a lot of effort. You should admire anybody that's doing it. Uh, okay, so... Yeah, I know a lot of people miss commodity time, and at times I miss it too, but uh, boy, I'll tell you, it's a, it's a grind. Because you guys take vacations whenever you want to. I don't get to. You want to have a report every single night. So every night of the year, I've got to do a commodity time report. And you know what? I'm getting too old for that. Okay, so let's go look at some new things. Uh, yes, we'll follow gold cycles, and I'll get to that shortly. When you buy on that trading date, when does exit those numbers? The exit is in a variety of ways. You could exit on the first profitable opening, a trailing stop, a target. I'll leave the exits up to you. But for these records, I'm used exiting on the first profitable opening with a dollar stop. Here's what's new. We have three new stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and a lot of people aren't aware of that. So I want to show those stocks to you. Um, the first one is Visa. Uh, you have no sound. Uh, I think everybody else is getting sound. So, Rick, I don't know what to tell you. No one else has mentioned that. Um, yeah, I'll leave and come back in and see what happens. Or come back in, uh, at the uh, 4.30. Okay, so, um, yeah, everybody else got good sound. So, this is basically a bank. Bank debt's popular, right? This is Visa, the credit card most all of us use, or one of the cards we have. It's been a strong stock this year. It was not making new highs when we last looked at it. The other stock added to the Dow is Nike. The shoe's on the other foot now. And Nike, this is right up through today, is not quite at a new high, but obviously a really strong barn burner of a stock. And Goldman Sachs. Well, Goldman Sachs had negative earnings that came out today. It opened down. It's coming back up. But you can see Goldman Sachs has not exactly lit the world on fire. It's not at new highs. So this is what they took out of the Dow. Alcoa, which is... Uh, Probably a good stock to take out. It's certainly been coming down a long ways. And uh, Hewlett Packard they took out, which has actually been one of the strongest stocks in here. And uh, finally, uh, Bank of America was taken out. There's a question, do institutions trade on these 
trading days of the month is that why they work well I, I don't have the absolute answer why trading days of the months work um, I see, you know, I've been using this stuff since the early 1980s, and it's, it continues to be successful. Those of you who traded with me at the Million Dollar Challenge, we always went long on trading day 19. Uh, and that's when I traded a million dollars in front of people with real money. Um, so exactly why, I think it's end of the month influences, but I don't know that I have the exact correct answer. So Bank of America was taken out. Okay, well that's what's happened. Now let me talk about what I think is going to happen. This was our mid-year forecast made in um, uh, the first part of July this year. This is what the market had done up to this time period. And um, uh, there's a good question. How many years do you use to make the statistics of trading days of the month this, with as much data as I can possibly get? I want to go back to all the possible rates, uh, the dates that I can get. So here is the 2009, uh, 2013 mid-year forecast, which suggested a high sometime in July, a bounce down, a rally up, and then, well, let's go take a look at that in a moment. We're going to overlay this on what's actually happened. This is the forecast that you just saw back here, right? This blue line is now the red line. And this was the forecast high. This was the forecast low for a rally here. And we're rallying now. This was taken two days ago. We're back up into this area. But the forecast suggests that the real buy point, which is part of this is about, is coming in down here in a little bit. I and mean, we'll revisit this in a moment. But I see that we have a lot of questions. Um, the Dow is a the big divergence at highs compared to the S&P. Is that bearish to stocks? Well, in this case, the reason the Dow is not as strong today, and we're going to show you that in a moment, is IBM is getting clobbered uh, today based on earnings. And um, so is Goldman Sachs. And that's not as effective as a weight in the S&P 500. Is the 19th the best day for all months? No, absolutely. It is not the best trading day for all months. It is definitely the best trading day for October. How many positions do you use in the ES best day strategy? Um, you mean the strategy that we trade at TradeStation? Uh, I'm not quite certain what that reference to. Yeah, uh, well, we, we only have one position at a time, but we probably have seven or eight different rules to get us in there. And that has been such a barn burner of a system. I think we've had two losing trades in that automatic trading strategy in TradeStation. Sure, maybe three. That's it all year long. Okay, so let's talk about the forecast. So the market is essentially done. Now, in terms of time, we would expect strong rallies here, pullbacks here. This is the time magnitude thing again that was clearly calling for a low here. And that was this forecast we saw that we did. in uh, actually, the data was done sometime in the middle of June. Then said we should bounce here. And it looks like we have another bounce coming up in here. Uh, yes, IBM. We'll talk about IBM. It did get hammered today, at least when I was last looking at it. They had miserable earnings coming out. Okay, so this is part of the forecast of what should be happening here. But I want to get even closer to this forecast, so hang in there. I want to look at some other markets to get a sense of what should be happening in the future. This was a natural cycle. This red line is the forecast we made at the first of the year. Those of you who purchased my first of the year forecast know this is what we're expecting. A rally to start in here in this time period it was a little early. There was a low or another low and then highs up here and a pullback. But November, December, we should see a rally up in the crude oil market. So this is intriguing. We're in the area to look for a buy point in here. So we want to consider uh, what higher energy prices can do to stock market prices and how those relate. That's one thing you want to look at. Another thing is gold. Here's our gold forecast. This was done at the first of the year also that we should start to sell off about here, find a low down here, and sometime late July, August, have a rally and a sell off come a little later after this rally. And as you can see in the next clip, here's the forecast. This is the line you were just looking at, except on a daily chart. Uh, we're going to get back to that S&P 100 chart in just a little bit, so bear with me. So this is the forecast for gold. Should have a low here, a big sell off here. Nice decline here, rally in this area, sell off here. And we're coming up into a rally in the gold market. Well, big surprise. What did gold do today? So you can see how the forecast can be used for turning points in the marketplace. But again, we don't know the absolute magnitude, but we know the time. I would point out a strange phenomenon in gold. Don't laugh at me too much today. 
this is something that I think we really owe a uh, tip of the hat to Tom McClellan for. I think he was the first one to really write about it. Gold tends to have large range days when we have full moons. Uh, go look at the sky tonight. Go look what gold did tonight. Got another full moon. Here is IBM. This is a forecast for IBM, which has been such a dominant stock market over all these years. This is our cycle forecast. This is what it would suggest that we should see an IBM this year. Well, this is the sell-off we're in here. This is IBM today, which the forecast was pretty good. It's saying we should have a sell-off in here. Coming down the end of November, we start to bounce up in here. If the moon can move the ocean, why not us? Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know. I have a son as a psychiatrist, and I've asked Jason, do you get more lunatic coming in during the lunar cycle stuff? He said, absolutely not, Dad. There, that's all. If there's no credibility to that at all, I don't know. But go back and look at your charts and full moons and gold. Uh, something's going on there. Um, so there's a, an idea of what we would expect in IBM, a bounce coming up at the end of this month around trading day 19. Uh, this red line is my cycle forecast. Uh, this is available in Ninja Trader and TradeStation. It takes the current cycles going on in the market and forecasts them into the future. Okay, let's look at some real stocks for a moment. Look what's happening in major stocks. This is General Electric, not at a new high. This is Microsoft, not at a new high and horrible gap back here. Here's the uh, uh, Pfizer Chemicals, big drug company, not close to a new high. Coca-Cola, Warren Buffett's big stock. Wow, Warren better go buy a lot of Coca-Cola. Uh, telephone, hmm, huge stock, not even close to a new high. Google, not close to a new high. Apple, well, that was the stock of the year. Uh, well, what happened to the year? A little different, isn't it? And McDonald's, um, and McDonald's earnings continue to be negative uh, or not as positive they've been in the past, I should say. So look at some really big major stocks, and here's Procter & Gamble's. You don't see all the strength that you see in the averages. So I think we're at a really mixed bag affair in the marketplace. It's a really, if there was ever a time of not a stock market, but a market of stocks, this is it. Because there's been some great stocks in here that should have rallied and didn't, and vice versa. Four out of 30 of the stocks in the Dow are at new highs. Nike, uh, Minnesota Mining, and GE are close, as is Boeing. Um, but rest of them are not. So what's going on? It's a really good question that we need to try to help and forecast things out with in terms of maybe some of our cycle forecasts. But let's take a little perspective of what's going on here. This is a chart from investment tools of the dividend yield in the Dow. It's currently about 2.3%. Now, when the dividend yield is low in this area, we can be vulnerable to bear markets. When it's high, over 4%, those are major buy points in the market, as we saw in um, 2002, as we saw in uh, 1990 and 2009. We don't see those very often, but it's uh, really significant. And for now, not in a value area of the market, we're in a slightly overvalued zone in the market. Okay, let's get back to that presidential cycle. I've updated this a little bit. I've made it a little larger for you so you can see a little more of what could be going on in the market. The presidential cycle, and this is really interesting. This is a little different than what we were looking at a moment ago. The, this presidential cycle I took, and I really believe politics does play an impact on, on stock prices. Yale Hirsch wrote about this years ago, and it continues to be true, but you have to be very careful with it. The chart you're looking at here was constructed in this fashion. I took the first year of the second term of presidents being in office. But there's a problem with that. Because you had FDR who was in office for three terms. So what's his first term, second term, third term? What about Harry Truman who had two terms, but the first term he stepped in for FDR? LBJ was, wasn't was two term or well, he was in for two terms, but he stepped in for John Kennedy. So I took the times when a, you had Ronald Reagan, you had Richard Nixon. I did take Truman's first time, uh, Bill Clinton's uh, uh, first year of his second term, and uh, uh, George Bush, the young George Bush, uh, first year of his second term in office. On average, look what happened. Pretty close to what happened this year, isn't it? And that gets us down into this 1118. 
Now, it's a little more difficult to predict out next year. I'm already working on the forecast for next year because of these presidential guys dying in office or being assassinated in office. And it used to be presidents didn't take office in January. They took office during the middle of the year. So there's a lot of things you have to filter out. But let me tell you this on balance. It looks like um, that we're going to have a pretty good uh, kickoff for the first of 2014. Um, you could break it down by party if you wanted to, but I'm, I think all parties share one thing in common. They want to get reelected. And the dirty dogs will do whatever it takes. So be liberal or conservative. Um, they're all going to goose the economy as much as they can. That's my working theory on that. Okay, let's talk about the art of projecting. I'm going to show you a couple things here. In a perfect cycle, the time from here to here is equal from the time here to here. And the price move from here to here is the same as the price move from here to here and here to here. Unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. We may have a low come in about here with a rally of this magnitude, and the next rally of a lot more magnitude, or the next rally of even a lot more magnitude. So while time tends to be more stable, it will obviously fluctuate, but the magnitude of the price swings also fluctuates even more has been my experience. The time is more stable. In a perfect cycle, if the markets weren't a perfect cycle, we'd know that there's a low coming out over here and the high would be at this price. But as I said, not a perfect world. So how do we handle that? This is a technique I developed in 1967. I think I've written about it once before. Let me share it with you. I'm going to take the time from this peak to this peak happens to be 121 days. I'm going to add that to the low in between to call the next low in the marketplace. So here's the formula. High to high. That is going to be projected from the low in between. Only all too often people will say, well, we've got 121 days high to high. There should be a high out here 121 days later. Maybe. That does not adjust or adapt for the declines in this move. And it's not quite a mirror image because this, well, it, in a sense it is a mirror image, but this move is shorter than this move. By using the count in this way, we account for the fact this move is a bigger move than this move. And that's a much better way of determining the next low. High to high determine lows and a low to low extended from the high in between is going to give you your projection for your high. So here we take 51 days added to this low. This is 51 days from here to here. I'm sorry, from these peaks are 51 days. We'll show the lows in a moment. 51 days from here to here, extended from the low in between. That was September 3rd or something like that. And these are trading days, not calendar days. And that's a great question because these data providers all have different days. Some use combined sessions. Some use pit sessions. Some use... Oh, it's not like it was in the old days, but I am just using, in this case, the number of days that TradeStation has. You could use the number of days in TradeStation or Ninja Shark, or not Ninja Shark, Ninja or Trade Shark. Um, but I'm just using counting the days on the chart itself. Okay, so look at this low. Um, we have 47 days from. Um, low to low from here to here is 47 days extended from this high in between gets to this 47 days does this work on any time frame it works pretty well because what you're measuring is the cycle so you could use it on interday charts if you want to heaven forbid you're an interday trader or weekly charts but the idea is to take a count from low to low extend it from the high in between or account from high to high and extend it from the low in between so here, 33 days from this high to this high. Extend it from the low in between, and we should start to see a rally right here. Now we have 30 days from this low to this low. Extend it from the high in between, and that projects out to October 4th. So that is one projection technique that you can use, and you could use it on a very short-term basis. I like to do it on a larger term. Sure, you could go from here to here. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's the high in the market. But I am much more interested in trying to capture large moves in the market as opposed to little tiny moves in the marketplace. Uh, 
call and I have you know I'm not a mathematician I have my background in art and journalism so I'm no great skill with uh, math all I can tell you is I've been using this since 1967 when I first discovered it I presented at a presentation at the foundation for the study of cycles and this and the uh, the uh, scientific investigation of reoccurring events in New York City with Parnell McKenna and uh, I've used it over the years is it perfect no does it frequently call market highs and lows yep it does so I still look at it. Uh, this has not been a book. I've, I've uh, only think written about this once before in one of my newsletters years ago. But we have so many people today. It's overwhelming the uh, amount of people that have come to learn about this. And I thought this is just something I'd like to share with you. Okay, well, here's something else we can do. Remember, we just looked back here. We said, well, this cycle's 33 days. Well, if I actually do a lot of cycle work, a lot of mathematical cycle work, I find we're currently in a 29-day cycle. And the cycle I can project out, there should be a low here, a low in here, a low here, and about 1029, and coming up 1128. Well, I put this in a video. No, <laughs> I'm too old to do videos. Um, but there is a 29-day cycle operating in the marketplace. Uh, so this is uh, the current cycle in the market, which would suggest we should start to pull down in here. And again, it doesn't project the magnitude of the move. It projects the timing of the move. So late in this month, we should start to see a rally. And around the middle of, Oct of November, we should start to see a decline until around Thanksgiving. This is uh, not a stock. This is the S&P E-mini, so I didn't point that out. You can always look up here in the upper corner, and you can see uh, what the market is. In this case, it is the S&P E-minis. So there's a lot of cycle stuff out there. Uh, it's 29.5, the lunar cycle. Well, there's that many. There's, what, 28 days in a lunar cycle. But remember, that's not market days. That's calendar days, and we're dealing here with calendar days. I want to show you something in the bond market. This is something we wrote about at the first of the year. This is what I called my kick-up cycle in the forecast report that we did this year. We said to expect buy signals right here, a rally, right here, a rally, right here, a flash rally. Same thing over here. And look at that, 1018. We have come on today's 1017. The bond market and this little module I've created, when it kicks up in here, and look what bonds did today, by the way. So we're one day off from it, right? We have these little kick-up cycles in the bond market that have been really accurate. And um, how do I generate all those cycles? Uh, actually, they're generated uh, in TradeStation um, by looking at the charts and counting the number of days between highs and lows and keeping records of this for a long time period. There's nothing that automatically does this for you. And then I've created, thanks to my programmer, some um, software that will grind up these numbers like a Cousinart and spit out this pattern that you see down here. And what I noticed, and I'm going to explain what this pattern is in a little bit to you, by the way, is that when I get these really big kick up moves in this particular cycle pattern, it's typical that we see really explosive flashy rallies in the bond market. Um, so let's continue with that. Uh, this is the bond market, and this is our true seasonal. And it's calling for a low in here, as is the red line, which is my natural cycle. And the natural cycle is really interesting. This is a cycle I arrived at four years ago. And I don't reveal it, but I'll tell you what I've done is find all years that have the same things in common, and then apply that to project out this year. And this clearly called for a significant sell-off in the bond market here, a bit of a rally here, rally up here, sell-off, rally and a sell-off, which is what we've been getting. Uh, question, do I work with Jen Larson, Glenn Larson and Genesis anymore? No, I don't. In fact, we're suing Glenn Larson and Genesis uh, over a great deal of money that they owe me, um, or at least that's our view. Uh, so this 1023 low, well, we might be a couple days early, but we're alerted in January of this year. Uh, that we should expect a significant rally to start at this time of the year. So then a trader can come in on a closer basis and start to look for buy signals and sell signals coming in the market. <laughs> this this first time I've sued anybody for quite a while. Uh, two years ago, we sued a brokerage firm who took my forecast report and sold it. Other than that, I, I'm not a litigious person at all. I just, just assume not see lawyers. 
Okay, so that's what I think is coming up in the bond market. So there's a pretty good idea of what I expect to take place in the bond market. That's backed by not only the, the regular seasonal in the marketplace, but also the um, rally that uh, is projected by the natural cycle. Well, there's a little further look at bonds. Um, it looks like we have another kick-up pattern coming about 1227. These are the most recent kick-up patterns in the bond market, by the way. So what's this based on? This is based on a 13-week cycle in the market in bonds. Bonds, I think, are very um, resilient to a 13-week cycle, also a 26-week cycle, and a 45-week cycle, because those are the traditional time periods of the bond market. Uh, notes are 30, 20 day, 30 night day notes, 90-day uh, notes, and this 13-week thing is really important in the bond market. So is there a reason? that it works in the bond market? Yes, I think that's just a traditional time. So again, we see the impact for bonds to start to rally right after Thanksgiving and would expect some rally to come into this market. So this little heads up for you. I hope that um, you're getting this. You know, I never know if people really understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking to the headset here in the Virgin Islands. And uh, I hope that you see that there is some rationale to what we're doing and that, that I'm being able to give you some more depth to your understanding in the marketplace. Oh, there's also a 67-week cycle. We wrote about this quite a few years ago. And the 67-week cycle I've mapped out for you here. Now, this 67-week cycle that you see here was known years ago. So once you find the cycle, you know, this, this low was known, I don't know, two or three years, and so at least 67 weeks in advance. And the 67-week cycle would call for a sell-off here, a rally here. Again, we're not we're more concerned about the time frame than the magnitude frame. And the time frame said we should have a buy about here and we have this kick up over here, right? The same kick up we saw over here. The only thing confuses me is when markets contradict each other, both supposed to have a bottom. Well, m you know, what the markets are supposed to do, what people tell you they're supposed to do, eh, not necessarily what they're going to do. Uh, yes, Mary Ellen, that is uh, prices, not interest rates. So I would continue to look for lower interest rates. So don't get this thing into your head about, oh, the market should do this. Gold can't go up when bonds go up. It did today. Well, gold can't go up when stocks go up and bonds go up. It did today. So this is what's coming up in the market based on this 67-week cycle. Um, here was the projected low. We should start to rally, start to sell off. Here's another low coming into this market about the, uh, December 12th. So again, around Thanksgiving of this year, we have the same kick-up pattern we saw back here. And then we see another low coming uh, in February. And it doesn't mean the market's going to come down like this. It means there's a buy point coming up at this time period. Okay, so even myself, when I first created this, oh, I got the market all figured out. And the market kind of moved like this. But I really learned it's more about the time frame than the magnitude frame of the marketplace. So you should be looking for a buy around Thanksgiving and again sometime uh, in uh, middle to late February. Okay, here's the final chart of the future. You ready? We're going to wrap up with this today. Here's the final chart of the future. This is what I see going on in the marketplace. This is that natural cycle. It's suggesting that we should see a low right around Thanksgiving time, right around the 18th. This is the presidential cycle. Aha, it's, I marked it as a low of April 18th. And we have the 65-day cycle really kicks in here to the upside starting about then. In fact, it actually starts to pick up in here. This is the last time it picked up. But notice it had a little short-term rally here, and then the big rally started over here. So it looks like we have a lot of bullish cycle stuff starting in here around Thanksgiving. So a couple of questions I'm going to answer these questions if I can. Larry, when you see the cycle, you choose to buy this day or do you prefer some volatility break? Okay, so we see that we have a cycle low coming in here. How do I get long? A cycle low coming in here, or a cycle peak coming in here. How do I get long? How do I get short? Oh, that's probably a whole nother webinar. But basically what I'm looking for, make it really simple, is a trend change. How do I measure the trend change? I can measure the trend change with a trend line 
if I see a particular pattern, one of my fake out patterns, inside, outside, day patterns, things of that nature. I can use the patterns to indicate a trend change. You could indicate a trend change with a simple moving average if you wanted to, or a parabolic, something of that nature, or my wheel trend stop, uh, or my three bar trailing stop. Those are things I've created, and you can use those. Okay, a couple of questions here. Um, uh, the natural cycle, well, that's just a cycle I created a long time ago. It's, it's, it's all similar years in the past. So if 1987 looked a lot like 2013, and it does, then I'm going to have that in that natural cycle. Um, are you referring to the stock commodities or Dow? Well, in this case, we're looking at the Dow Jones Industrials right here uh, in this chart, but it would reference the S&Ps and the E-minis and all that. Are these cycles including in annual forecast? Yeah, oh yeah, these are included in my forecast reports. And um, uh, are there are things that are presented being new. Well, um, probably. Well, the natural cycle I've been using in, in my forecast reports for three or four years now. Uh, we've tried to do some more research. You know, I'm, I, this, let me tell you, it's hard to forecast the future. It's not easy. So I'm still learning. I've studied all the stuff that the old guys did, Gann and all those guys, and I'm, you know, I've learned some stuff from that, frankly. And I'm trying to learn more. Thanks to computers and a really good programmer, I'm able to ferret out more good stuff in here, but it's still a learning process. Can this cycle be used on all markets? The uh, natural cycle can be used on absolutely all markets. Uh, the 65 day cycle, you know, this one you, you tailor and find whatever the market forecast is. Uh, the forecast for 2014, uh, be ready, I don't know. Um, I start working on these in October and I hopefully am through by Christmas Day. So right around the end of December. If you are looking at conflicting cycles, which one will you trust? The longer term ones. Do you feel high frequency trading is affecting the volume of cycle analysis? Um, on very short term cycles, yes. On these very long term cycles, no. When you are learning what happened to make you more consistent, was it gradual or did it just click? Well, I'm still not always consistent. I don't think you're ever going to be real consistent. This is a tough business. Um, so it comes and it goes. There's a question about my darlings of the Dow. That's a system that we developed years ago where you buy about now and hold on for six months. The buy point uh, is just about now. Uh, this is the, when the low comes in and those stocks have been selected, yes. Um, could someone really passionately let it learn with you as an apprentice? <laughs> well, I, we get that request about uh, three times a week and Louise doesn't like house guests. Um, do you ever add up all your various cycles to get? Yeah, I've tried adding up composites to cycles to get composites. I haven't found this particularly good. Um, and high frequency trading get us stopped out more often. Uh, well, if you're getting out stopped out a lot, I'll tell you why. You ready for this? If you're getting stopped out a lot, it's because your stops are too close to the market. You're not willing to risk enough for the current volatility of the market. The problem is your stops, not high frequency trading. How often are the Virgin Islands hit by hurricanes? Well, we didn't even have a bad storm this year. Um, but in uh, 2000, well, 1998, they had Hugo. That was a really bad one. How many of your personal trades present-wise are based on cycles? Uh, how about Apple? Apple's, boy, we had a great call on Apple all year long. Well, again, I use the cycles as a tool to say, here's a time to focus my attention. I really see this the most with day traders who think they can come in and make money every single day trading. Well, let me tell you, today isn't like uh, the market was uh, this day right here. It wasn't like the market back here, was it? We knew we had a blast off buy signal to be a buyer on this day. We did for this day as well. So you can't say all days are equal. So I'm saying I want to focus in at these time periods. That's why I use the cycles. That's what I what I'm interested in doing with the cycles is a wake up call. Hey, Larry, you better be alert. Something's we know gold's going to rally about now. Uh, bonds are going to rally about now. We better be paying attention to these things. Um, what has been my experience, I guess, with planetary feature stuff? Well, I've tried all the planetary stuff out there. And again, I don't know anything much about astrology, but I haven't found any of it that's very consistent, to be really honest with you. Uh, there's a, one guy in Australia who's doing some stuff with, uh, who's shared some stuff with me. He's done a great job. He's had some really good forecasts. 
but uh, the public ones out there one thing I seem to notice all astrologers check this out yourself are perpetually bearish <laughs> they're always bearish so um, uh, you have to put that in with uh, everything else as well uh, Chris Carroll in the spiral calendar is very good Chris is a great guy uh, what a remarkable talent he is so yeah definitely and I think he's using lunar influences uh, I'm not certain I don't think anybody knows what Chris is using Oh gosh, there's so many questions coming in here. I can't answer them. I can't even read them as fast as they're coming in. Uh, the COT report book. Well, I'm glad you like that book. That's uh, it's, I've enjoyed that. I don't you I do breath data. I don't use a McClellan oscillator. I do look at it because uh, it's a, one of the few letters I read is uh, Tom McClellan because I knew Sherm. I, I've known his dad for 40 some years now. Um, Is there a percentage of average true range would you say is more indicative for the E minis to use as a stop size? Well, now throwing out a ballpark figure here, 90% of the average true range of the last three days. So again, that's 90% of the average range of the last three days. That's a lot of volatility in a market. Um, is uh, I will answer this one. I developed an indicator quite a few years ago that is a substitute or stand-in for the COT index which is really valuable right now because with this government shutdown we have not gotten commitment trader report well my stand-in indicators have just emulate the actual commitment trader report so well I don't even need the commitment trader report anymore because they almost match perfectly uh, my um, stand-in for the COT report so uh, we will we've been using that and of course we have a lot of markets when I'm in Japan or wherever uh, that they don't have a COT report so we can use um, uh, my stand-in for it and uh, that's done a really good uh, job in, in virtually all markets so yeah we still use that you batted against Dave McNally in mine at North Dakota I wasn't catching in, in uh, mine it but I caught for Dave quite a bit wow does that bring back memories uh, Dave passed away a few years ago uh, in terms of apprenticeship and stuff, guys, uh, once a year I do an intensive training seminar here in the Virgin Islands. It's uh, three, four days. We all get together here, and then uh, we do a 50-day follow-up with webinars. That's the only really intensive thing that I do. I, I just, you know, I trade. I'm not out there marketing. Look at this. I mean, you guys would have paid how much for this, right? What do we charge for it? Zero. Um, so that's, uh, you know, we do it a little bit differently. Um, is your CO2 available to your students? Well, we do. A, what I do is a uh, Larry TV every um, every weekend, almost every weekend, and I, I point out the markets that I think are the most set up for the markets to move. Has the market been better for you now than 20 years ago? Um, you know, the market's always been difficult. Uh, I don't know. There's ever an easy time. In fact, it's interesting. You read the old books now. Say, oh, the markets used to be easier. Well, the markets have always been difficult. The truth be known. And um, yeah, bullish on grains, absolutely. We forecast this bull market in soybeans. And uh, just recently on Larry TV, again, we said get ready for the market to rally. Well, look, look what's been going on in here. Oh, gosh, guys, we're going to have to about wrap this up because we're going to do another one of these in half an hour from now. Um, a sign-up place on the website. Uh, go to um, uh, ireallytrade.com, and you can sign up for our newsletters. It's free and all that stuff there, whatever we do. Um, uh, how does TradeStation to compare to Trade Navigator? Well, TradeStation is more versatile. It's a heck of a lot cheaper. It's a better deal. Uh, it's a little more complex to use. Is the difference? Yeah, corn too. Um, you know, I don't do high frequency trading. I don't believe in day trading. Frankly, maybe it's my age. I used to do it, but you know, you stack the odds against you. Maybe we'll do a day trading webinar one of these times. But uh, we're going to start to wrap it up here. Recap on gold. Yeah, gold's in an, in an uptrend starting on here. Oh my gosh, Dan Halleck's daughter is on here. Wow, well, you please tell Dan hello for me. We're looking forward to seeing he and his beautiful wife come down here in the Virgin Islands and get away from that Montana snow. Am I going to put my indicators on Thinkorswim? Absolutely not. Why? Thinkorswim took my good friend Tom DeMarc indicators, pirated them, put it on Thinkorswim. And if Thinkorswim paid me millions of dollars, I wouldn't put my indicators there for what they did because I would lose my friendship with Tom and that friendship was lasted for so long means a lot more to me than any amount of money in the world what is required data provider for ninja trader uh, ninja trader has a lot of different uh, data providers you'll have to ask them about that 
Hey, we're going to wrap it up here. What I hope I've accomplished today is, is open up your minds about how we can use cycles, how you can use cycles in the market to make some projections. Take this stuff. Remember what Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. Trust what I showed you here, but verify. Put this on a chart. Take these high to high extended from the low. Put that on some charts. Make certain you see how this works. And uh, I hope you've uh, been able to learn a little bit today. And um, I hope that is of some value to you. And uh, one of these days, I might do another one of these. But uh, until then, uh, good luck, good trading. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with my stuff, go to our website. You can sign up for all our free stuff there. I think you'll enjoy it. So as always, I'm going to sign off wishing you good luck and good trading.